Welcome to Awareness to Action, a podcast brought to you by the Northwestern Community Services Board Prevention Department. I'm your host, Casey, a social worker and prevention specialist here in Virginia. Our podcast goal is to promote wellness through conversation, connection, and action. We hope each episode will leave you feeling inspired and motivated to look for ways to get involved in your own community. Hello, and welcome back to Awareness to Action. I'm happy to welcome Jordan Brooks to the show today. Jordan serves as the Regional Suicide Prevention Program Manager for DBHDS Region 1, as well as the Lock and Talk Virginia Coordinator, a comprehensive suicide prevention initiative provided across the Commonwealth. Jordan is a licensed professional counselor and has over 12 years of experience working as a crisis clinician for both youth and adults. Jordan currently co-chairs the Suicide Prevention Awareness and Resource Council in Charlottesville, Virginia. I felt grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation with Jordan. She does incredible work in the state of Virginia to break down stigma and facilitate conversation about suicide. Jordan's vulnerability and genuine concern for the mental health and wellness of her community shines through her efforts and her words. As a heads up, we talk about suicide loss and suicidal ideation heavily in this episode. I think it's an important conversation, and I hope you'll learn a lot from it. Jordan, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm glad you're here. Uh, So let's start with you telling our listeners about your career thus far and the work that you're doing now. Sure. So currently I am the Regional Suicide Prevention Coordinator for Region 1, which is a lot of words just to say that I I cover um, a big area in Virginia. Um, My primary role is to coordinate Lock and Talk Virginia, which is a statewide suicide prevention initiative. And we can talk a little bit more as we go. Actually, my career when I first started was mostly clinical. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Virginia. Um, So I've kind of done a a lot of different things uh, leading up until this point, primarily working with uh, youth and in crisis situations. So I've I've been a a TDT counselor, so a day treatment counselor. I've worked in like mobile crisis, crisis stabilization. So lots of clinical work. Um, Up until about 2018, um, I switched over and started working in prevention and got in it and loved it. Um, Started kind of in a a high school setting, but really started teaching mental health first aid, all of those things, and just fell in love with just that aspect of it. Um, So all of, you know, kind of my clinical experience is kind of compounded and and really serves me well um, in the role that I'm in now. And in about, I guess it was November 2020 is when I transitioned into this role um, and have really loved every minute of it. So suicide is not easy to talk about. There is a lot of stigma, a lot of emotion involved. Um, And we'll talk more about those one-on-one conversations in a bit, but a large part of your work is reaching particular groups and demographics and giving them the language and tools to address suicidality. So essentially empowering people who are in direct service roles. So I'd love for you to tell us what that involves. Sure. Yeah, I mean, language is so important when we talk about suicide. Um, to kind of give it a little bit of context, when we when we first, when the Region 1 Committee kind of first developed Lock and Talk, they really wanted something that, you know, could really make a difference, right? What were we seeing in our communities? And of course, they looked at data, and I'm not going to bore you with data, but, you know, looking at what are the most high risk of, of those individuals? Um, and, you know, we, over the years, it's kind of been consistent. But over the past two years, we've really tried to, yes, you know, really honor that data and really look at what that means. But to really, we have to reach everyone. We know that suicide doesn't just happen in one small group or to one small, you know, population. We know that it touches everybody. And the past two years have really, that's kind of been my focus is how do we reach everyone? How do we talk about this? Because we know that it happens in every demographic and every, you know, age group and in every, um, you know, ethnic background. So like, how do we kind of tailor what we talk about um, to be able to reach, you know, everyone in that setting? So kind of pragmatically, we've looked at it as, 
developing our materials that can kind of reflect those demographics, right? I mean, if you're, you're looking at something on social media or a website, and if it doesn't really look like you, you're like, oh, well, this doesn't necessarily pertain to me. So really trying to make materials um, that can reach all of those groups. And we've done a lot of translations into materials to just to give people the language. Um, and we have, you know, ways to go. Um, but stepping out of that and really thinking about how do we just connect with people, right? Because suicide is, is something that is really, really hard to talk about, like you mentioned. And we kind of have to take that pressure off of it. So yes, it's very important. And it's, it's a very heavy to- topic to talk about. But like, how do we make it a normal piece of everybody's conversation um, and really give them, you know, language? Uh, and really the language is we have to use the word suicide. Um, and that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, even if you do this work and you ask the question all the time, it's still really challenging. Um, but that's one of the things that we try to empower people to do, regardless of where you came from, what your background is, what your profession is. is you know, we have to really get comfortable with asking those hard, hard questions. And something that I know is important to you is vocalizing that it's okay for these conversations to be scary and to feel vulnerable and that you, you don't have to feel, you know, a hundred percent ready to take them on and and confident in that. Why does it feel important to you to emphasize that? Yeah. You know, a lot of, I teach quite a bit to, you know, communities, but I also teach a lot to police and fire and, you know, they, they follow protocols, right. To the, to the T and like, give me the words to use. And, and one of the things I even tell to them and the community members is you can get it wrong. You can muddle through it and, and step all over your words and, you know, say something maybe you didn't mean to, but that's okay. And it's okay to just say like, you know what, my bad, that did not come out how I wanted it to come out. But I'm really concerned and we have to use the word suicide. If we're, if we're thinking that that's what's going on, we have to use the word, but you don't have to have it perfectly scripted. It doesn't have, you don't have to have a clinical background to use the words. And, and really to me, that's showing that genuine level of concern and just owning up to, you know what, this is really hard for me too, because I care about you. And so we're going to muddle through this together and fumble through it. But I want to do that because I care and I want to make sure that you're going to be here, you know, and I'm going to get you whatever support it is that you need. And I think I, if I'm on the receiving end of help and care, I would rather it be a mumbly mess, but feel the care and concern than like a clinical script Right. without that. Yeah. I mean, there's still so much stigma attached, you know, and when people talk about suicide and, you know, when you sit down and have those conversations, a lot of people typically will be like, well, if I say this, then that means I have to go to a hospital. That means that I have all of these things that I have to follow, but that doesn't necessarily have to be. And so when you can take that kind of clinical, you know, ness out of it, that's not really a word, but it, it helps people feel more at ease to, yeah, no, like, that's not what we, we don't have to do that, not necessarily. Um, It's just really, sometimes it's just talking about the thoughts and feelings that you have going on um, that could really set the tone for, you know, healing and hope and recovery for people. Let's talk more about that because we're, we are still in the pandemic. We're, as a worldwide community, there's more grief, more stress, more isolation than, I guess I can't speak for all of history, but I would say more than ever before. Um, And when we know someone who seems like they're struggling, how do we approach a conversation? How do we hold that space and make sure we're non-judgmental? Yeah. You know, really it just comes down to connection and saying, you know, we're not meant to be alone. You know, humans, we're just not built that way. And all we really want at the very base of it is to feel seen and heard and connected and loved. And it's really all about, you know, hey, I see you. Uh, You know, I see whatever it is that you're struggling with and I care. And really, you know, it doesn't have to be any heavier than that and can really hopefully will allow that person to 
feel your genuineness and open up and let them kind of lead the conversation, um, you know, with, with whatever it is that they feel like they want to talk about. Um, and if it's not you, you know, and you can say that, hey, like, if it's not me, let me help you get to, to someone that can, you know, who is someone that you trust and are willing to talk to, because this is important. You know, it matters. I, a common misconception, and you can speak to this much more than I can, is that if we mention our concern or mm-hmm. ask if someone's thinking about yeah. suicide, that we're going to somehow put it in their head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we're going to encourage yeah. that in some way. Yeah. No, that is probably one of the biggest misconceptions about suicide um, is that if we mention it, if we say these things, if we ask about a plan, we're going to put all of that into their head. And, and what we know to be true is that that's never the case. You know, if someone is really in that dark space and is thinking about suicide and maybe has a plan, it's been there, you know, and, and really all we're doing is just kind of bringing it to the surface and shining a light on it a little bit. Um, you know, that a lot of that word wording is used in mental health first aid, which I really love because, you know, really helps people understand that all we're doing is just bringing that person to a place where they can feel seen. And what we know about the research behind that is, you know, just by asking the question, even if they don't have a plan, even if it's just, just kind of icky thoughts and really sad thoughts that they're going through, they can feel so much relief with feeling like, okay, like this person actually sees how bad I've been struggling. And I, I, they are, they're willing to sit with me in this mess because they're willing to ask a question. And that can just take that burden of having to bring it up themselves because, you know, a lot of people are fearful of, well, are they going to judge me for even thinking this way? You know, maybe they've had a worse life than me and, and they're going to think that I shouldn't feel this way, but it's really, it's, it's a lot of times we find them it's not the case, you know, but if we can just open it up and ask the question, a lot of times people are, are really going to be more apt to take a breath and okay, let's talk about it. And with with time and with practice of, mm-hmm. of being a person that others can come to and, and checking in like that discomfort that we talked about earlier, it fades away a little more each time. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, okay, I know how to have these conversations and I know how to express concern and, right. and I can, you know, share what I feel in ways that is meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, practice makes perfect. That's kind of a cliche thing to say, but, but really in all reality, we know that there over the past several years of this pandemic, it's really affected everybody and people maybe who have never felt that way before, you know, and they're kind of mumbling through of like, what is this? But it really, the more we can get comfortable, you know, one of the things that I've spoken on before is oftentimes we go about our day, right. And walk past somebody and it's like, Hey, how are you? But like, do you really care? How, how they're doing, right? Like, do you really kind of stop and say, like, how are you? Because what if they say, I'm not doing great today. And I think we need to still shift in that direction where that's okay. If, if you know, you walk past somebody on the street and they give you an honest answer of like, I'm having a really bad day. Like, okay, let's talk about it. You know, the more we can get comfortable with that, the more people are going to be willing to open up and talk about it because it's an everyday thing. You know, it, it affects all of us, regardless of our educational background or whatever, even if we have it seemingly all together, right? We all have days that are hard. And we've talked about this before on the show, but there's, we have to be willing to receive that and to share that. Like in order to normalize that, I have to be willing to say, you know, I just had a really big cry because I'm yeah. really stressed about a lot that's happening. And yeah. for that to be okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think that was a really hard lesson for me to learn, right? I did this work for so long. <clears throat> and then right before the pandemic, my husband actually had a pretty significant suicide attempt and was hospitalized for a good amount of time. All my clinical training, you know, I should have known how to handle that. And not to say that I didn't, but I had a really hard time acknowledging how it affected me. Um, and that was something that was hard for me to step out and be like, you know what, this is really challenging for me. Yet, yes, like we're, we're getting him through his recovery. He's been in recovery for two years and he's doing great. 
But that was hard for me because I teach it all of the time of like, we got to have these conversations, but yet I, I struggled. And so, you know, we're all human and we all have a hard time owning up to our humanness, right? That like, I'm not supposed to have a bad day, I'm not supposed to get it wrong, um, but we do. And so I think that really taught us a lot as even though we're professionals and we do this work, we still have days that are hard. And the best way that I can connect with people when we're doing education and we're doing trainings is to tell a little bit of that, you know, our story and be vulnerable and honest of like, you know what, today was not a good day. Um, because, you know, people are really going to see that, that compassion and that genuineness and like, all right, it's okay to be human. Um, you know, and it, that, that has kind of served me well, it was having kind of some of that experience as, you know, as well as my professional yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes we get stuck in kind of extreme thinking, like you said earlier, everything looks like it's good, but I'm having a hard time. Mm-hmm. And I, I think sometimes we feel like, well, everything is really good. So if I say I'm struggling, then everyone's going to think I'm not grateful or sure. um, like right now I have a lot of exciting changes happening in my life. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very grateful for them. I yeah. also am totally overwhelmed by all the change that's yeah. happening. Mm-hmm. And I keep, I keep, when I talk about it with loved ones, I keep saying, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. Like, it's all good. It's all good. But, but like, mm-hmm. I don't need to preface that. It's no. okay. Like it can all exist together. Nobody exactly. needs a justification for mm-hmm. what we're feeling. Right. Yeah. And I think too long we have gone feeling like that. You know, that if everything, if we have all of our ducks in a row, we have a roof over our head, we have a job, we have all these things, like we shouldn't have any negative feelings. And, and that's just not the case. You know, that's, that's just dismissing the fact that we are all human and broken and have the same emotions, you know, regardless of what's going on. We all also walk into life and even the roles that we're in with our own experiences. You know, I don't know what you've experienced in your life much less the people down the road, you know, and I think we too often forget that, that there are so many other things that kind of go into who this person is today. And we have to start looking at at that, you know, that we all come in with so many different life experiences. There, I can think of a million examples of times I've been humbled when I think I know everything about someone or (laughs) I feel like they're (laughs) acting a certain way because of something. And then I get another piece of information and I'm like, oh, Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I had like one one hundredth of the story. So right. why did I think I could I could understand it? Exactly. Yeah, and you know, and it's it's kind of shifting away from what's wrong with you to what happened. You know, I, we love that kind of concept that came out of you know Oprah's book is is really what happened to you, right? And, and having that in the back of your mind as you engage with the world um, can really be a super humbling experience. Yeah. So you've now talked about being in a supportive and caring role professionally and in your personal life. What can we do to take care of ourselves when we're having these conversations or someone we care, you know, we're having these conversations often in a professional space or with a loved one in our personal life? Yeah. You know, having those conversations both personally and professionally, is not easy. And I think the first step is recognizing that. Um, that it's not easy. And acknowledging that we are going to have residual feelings or thoughts or whatever it is that not kind of may bubble after kind of intervening with someone that may be in a crisis situation. And so we, we often call them regulation buddies. Um, but when we're doing community trainings and we talk about, you know, it's okay to debrief, you know, it's okay to feel overwhelmed or stressed or sad or sometimes even inadequate that maybe I didn't help this person the, the best that I could, but it's first acknowledging that and acknowledging whatever it is that you're going through and thinking about and feeling and finding for yourself that trusted person that you can, you know, walk through it and vent a little bit and get all your thoughts in a row. And even sometimes it may be that you have to seek out support for yourself. Um, you know, that was something that I had to learn and, and I, I spent you know, a good amount of time in, in therapy as well. And that was hard as well. But, you know, I think that first step is just acknowledging that this stuff is hard 
And it's not meant, we're not meant to shoulder it for other people just because we're sitting in it with them and we're helping them through it doesn't mean we have to take it on. And, and we really have to know, we can't pour from an empty cup, you know, a lot of that metaphor is used, but we really can't. Uh, we can't help others if we're not at a space to, you know, to accept that help for ourselves. We have a lot of um, professionals in mm-hmm. helping roles that listen to this podcast. And I think something that I have found is that it's helpful to have someone in my workplace that I can talk to about, you know, what I've just experienced in a session or whatever, you know, where they're within the the confines of confidentiality with me and we're on a team setting and they understand the professional part. And then it's helpful in my life to have my loved ones Mm -hmm. where I'm not talking with them about the specifics, but I'm talking with them about how I feel and they know me, you know, they know me in a way that my coworkers don't. And I think that balance is really important for professionals. It is. Yeah. I mean, we also, we, we obviously have to keep in mind that, you know, protected health information and privacy and confidentiality, but yeah, I mean, they can see us in a different light. Uh, professionals can give us a good, you know, like, okay, like this is what we need to do next. Like, you know, this is how we can move forward for them from this, but our loved ones can really help ground us in a way that, you know, we maybe don't have in our professional roles. So I want to go back because earlier you mentioned mental health first aid, which mm-hmm. is an incredible resource. I would love for you to tell our listeners more about that. Sure. So uh, mental health first aid is really a public education program that was developed um, actually in Australia in 2008, I believe. Um, and so and it came to the United States in 2012. And since then has gone, you know, a lot of revisions, a lot of supplements, a lot of kind of ways we can reach the community. So at its core, it's really just like a, a, a first aid class. It, it kind of walks through how to recognize and identify signs and symptoms that someone may be struggling with a mental health challenge, whether that be depression, anxiety, suicide, substance use, it kind of you know runs the spectrum there. So how to really identify those people? And then what do you do? It, we have, it has like a really set action plan. You know, how do you talk to somebody? How do you listen? what resources are available. Um, So it really is a good general class to talk about mental health in a non-stigmatizing way, in a non-judgmental way. Um, And it's been adapted for adult, youth, our veterans, um, higher education, education, sorry, like um, college level students, uh, police, fire, um, educators. So it's really been, you know, adapted to have these conversations and in various populations and groups. It's probably one of my favorite things to teach. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Um, I have participated in the class before. That's (laughs) an awesome, awesome resource. Also safe talk is something that you Mm -hmm. work with. So love for you to talk about that too. Yeah. So safe talk is one of the uh, many programs that has come out of living works, which is an international based group that really works, its sole focus is suicide prevention and really making our communities um, safe from suicide. So Safe Talk is really, it's a about a three to four hour class um, and it really focuses on suicide alertness. So it's talking through what could those invitations of suicide look like um, and how do we ask those questions? So again, it's kind of practicing. There's a lot of role play in both of these classes. And I know people don't like role plays. I hated them in grad school, but practice makes perfect. You know, you can have these conversations in a non-crisis situation. You're a little bit more comfortable to have them when you need them. Um, So Safe Talk really focuses on, you know, signs, warning signs of suicide. How do you ask the question? And then what's the next step? And really in Safe Talk, it's connecting them to someone who can do a little bit more of an intervention. Um, They also have assist, which is kind of the next piece, which is a two day training um, that really talks about suicide intervention skills. Um, And it's it's a pretty intense class, but it's a super rewarding class. You walk away really feeling equipped to sit with somebody when they're struggling and getting them to the appropriate treatment. And for everyone listening, I'll will include information about that in the episode description. Um, there, these are great learning tools for mm-hmm. individuals, or if, you know, you want to bring them into your organization, uh, yeah. and educate 
a larger number. And they're free. We do them yeah. for free. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't realize that we do them for free. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, um, it, it's a great, great resource. I also just have a whole list of all the things I'd like you to talk about, Jordan. <laughs> lock and talk. I know you touched yes. on it earlier, but mm-hmm. lock and talk is really special. And I'd love for you to dive into that a little more. Yeah. So like I mentioned before, it was created out of region one. So you know, it's kind of a larger area in Virginia. So it was um, back in 2014, they kind of had this money that came down from the state about just suicide prevention specific. And they were giving all of this, the CSB regions this money to, what can we do with this? How, do, how can we use this money to really prevent suicides in our community? So the Region 1 Prevention Director Committee created Lock and Talk, um, really looking at the data and how it was affecting our communities. You know, How do we create something that's palatable for people to understand and give them a toolkit, you know, give them something they can do. You know, a lot of people, when you talk about mental wellness and suicide, well, tell me what I can do. Well, give me a script, right? Tell me, tell me some things I can do. And this was kind of one of the things that came out of it is really kind of a one-two punch. So the lock piece is promoting lethal means care and safety. So that's um, really educating communities on how to secure things like firearms and medications um, knives, things like that. We know that the majority of suicide deaths, it's about 60% happen with a firearm. So it's educating people on how important it is to properly store those firearms. We actually hand out free trigger locks and cable locks to the community. We give out free medication lock boxes. So really kind of that piece first. And then the next component is talk, which is exactly what we just talked about. You know, safe talk, talk mental health first aid. It's it's really those gatekeeper trainings, we call them to, you know, help identify people at risk and then give people the tools to have those conversations. And over the past two years, you know, we've really tried to kind of grow that component of it to help reduce that stigma and to help have conversations and just normalize that mental health is here and we, we know it's important and how do we recognize it? How do we help those that, that need it? Um, so that's kind of really been my focus over the past two years is how do we elevate this talk piece because it is such a vital piece in suicide prevention. So we, the Region 1 Committee is still the founders um, and the, the developers. We are creating new content constantly. Uh, we now have all 40 CSBs um, in Virginia, our partners. We have a national partner in New York. We are partners with uh, the National Guard. So it's been such a huge expansion since they first created it uh, in 2015, 2016, and when it was kind of official. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been really amazing to see its progression. And, um, and you know, I, I have all things Lock and Talk branded. So my kids have stickers too, and they can tell you exactly what Lock and Talk is. But it's really making it a, a, a thing where even kids can understand how important this is um, when we're, when we're talking about suicide, my undergraduate internship, I helped with some of the lock and talk materials and going to events and talking about it. And it was so fun because either I was talking with someone who had never heard of it and was, Mm -hmm. you know, interested in learning about it for the first time, or I was talking with someone who (laughs) had heard about (laughs) lock and talk and was like all in about (laughs) securing lethal means and, and, just very excited mm-hmm. about increasing access to yeah. materials that help with these conversations and mm-hmm. um, with all of that, which is fun. Mm-hmm. It's an easy thing to get behind because it's it it's only good. Right, right. And, you know, we have a website, blackandtalk.org, and we have tons and tons of resources for families, for individuals, for schools, um, you know, really just as a space where people can go and access how do I have this conversation? What do I look out for? And then it connects you to your CSB. Um, so we really you know, are trying to continually grow it um, and make it, you know, make it what people need it to be. But it's a, it's a great, great resource as well for folks to visit. So any other resources that you feel excited to share or want people to know about or? Oh, there's tons, right? I mean, so one of the things that I think people it's not necessarily forget about probably not the best word to use but our community services board throughout virginia are so you know just have such a large scope of services and 
materials and resources and just wonderful people that oftentimes we forget that they exist. And so that's one I am always, you know, trying to connect people to their CSB um, and all 40 of them in the state give out the same materials that we give out in region one. Um, so really, you know, I always want to highlight them and the great work that they do and throughout, throughout the state. You know, that's, we have a, a big, a rock star team of prevention staff throughout the state. So I always want to highlight them, but you know, there's tons of other trainings that don't, it's not just suicide or safe talk in mental health first aid. There's QPR, which is another kind of smaller scale suicide alertness um, training. You know, there's just tons of, of education and resources out there. You just gotta, you know, go check them out a little bit and figure out, I think, what's in your area. A lot of people oftentimes get bogged down in like, I don't know where to turn. And sometimes if you can just start with one space, you know, start with me, even if you just go to Lock and Talk or you go to your local CSB website, you can oftentimes get ping to the right sources and like learn more about what's in your area because then you know what to offer someone, you know, when you're having those conversations. Yeah. And, and these tools are so accessible to us. Like, I think mm-hmm. we underestimate the power of a Google search, right? <laughs> you, you just need yeah. a couple of words and you can find and all of there. this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and we do, we love, we love promoting the CSBs. Everybody yeah. in this state has one. <laughs> if you have a CSB looking out for you, you just have to figure out <laughs> what your Which region one it is. is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so Jordan, I, would love to know what keeps you feeling hopeful about this work and centered in your purpose? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think that's kind of evolved for me over the past few years. I, I didn't think that I would love prevention work as much as I do and did when I started. Um, but for me, you know, it's really getting into the community and hearing people's stories. You know, we, one of the things that we've done over the past few years to kind of normalize it is to bring kind of speakers and speaker events that with people with lived experience, just to talk, you know, not everybody wants to attend a lecture or a class and we get that, but I'm just so inspired by those people that share their story. Uh, because to me, that's hope right there, you know, and, and that's what keeps me going is that we, even though sometimes we feel like we don't make a difference, we're not making a difference. Oh, what am I, you know, all this work that we're putting into stuff, I don't, I don't see it, but it's there. Um, It may just not, we may did not know about it right when we want to know about it, but the, the stories that people have about their hope and recovery and their healing, honestly, is, is what keeps, keeps me doing the work. You know, it's hard. It's hard. And there are times where, you know, I get, get tired and weary and right. But those, those, um, meeting those people in the community is what really, you know, keeps me going. And there's hope everywhere. Like it's whenever I'm feeling discouraged, it's not long before I encounter someone or hear a story that reminds me of mm-hmm. why all of the, any work that serves others, why it matters. Right. It's not hard to find. No, no, it's not. But, you know, sometimes people forget to look or they get so bogged down in the day to day, they forget to work, you know, to look for it. But you're right. It is. It's there. So I'm going to ask you one last question that we ask everyone. What does the process of awareness to action mean to you? Yeah. So for me, and kind of looking at the work that I do is everybody knows that mental health exists, right? And we also know that there's a stigma. We've done so much work to help reduce it, but we still know that there's work to be done. And for me, awareness to action is knowing, right? Knowing that there is a stigma, but also knowing that there is hope, there is healing, there is recovery. You know, people who may experience a a challenge, mental health challenge can still lead very, lead fulfilling lives. And so it's putting into action and by asking those questions and really sitting with people in it um, and helping those have those conversations. Maybe it's educating someone in the community about what you've learned in a class or, you know, whatever it is, it's really, we have this knowledge, we have this awareness that it's a, it's a thing and it exists. So really just each day, little by little, you know, helping spread that um, around, I think is, is how we're, we're going to continue to do this work together. You know, 
it's, it takes takes village to to be able to do the work that we do. And it's small incremental change, small change. conversation yeah. at a time. Yep. Yeah. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing about uh, the really, really vital work that you're doing in the community and your own story, how this relates to you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. And thank you again to Jordan for joining us. If you liked this episode, share it with a friend. And subscribe to Awareness to Action so you don't miss any future conversations.